views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today, we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough as well as New York City. We update you on the latest with regards to the coronavirus pandemic. And then a little bit later on in the show, we're going to talk to Elizabeth Carazza, who's a career strategist. She's going to give us the information that we need to know about how to navigate staying at home, homeschooling during COVID. Then we're also going to have a special guest, Council Member Fernando Cabrera from the District 14, who's been personally impacted by COVID. He's going to share how his family's recovering and also the services that are available both federally and statewide for Bronxites. And then we'll also talk with another assembly member who goes front and center on the front lines, Assemblywoman Karinas Reyes. She'll talk about her work in depth front line at the hospital and there's a nurse and then also working as a state assembly person. And then Mercy College is also assisting in the COVID crisis. We'll talk to the director of the Physician Assistance Program as she tells a little bit about how her students have been impacted and how they're also helping along with Elmhurst Hospital. And then also seniors, the most vulnerable population in COVID-19. How are senior services being affected? We're going to introduce you to the Riverdale Senior Services and talk about those things and how seniors can still be serviced during a time such as this. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. want to welcome to open today is wednesday april 15th and you are watching open the only show that brings the bronx and new york city straight to you on your tv set we also want to welcome all of our viewers who are watching live on manhattan neighborhood network as open is also being broadcast live simultaneously on the mnn channel we invite you to stay connected to us also on all of our social media platforms at bronxnet tv and there you can find out the latest, be able to navigate as BronxNet aims to bring you content and information during COVID-19. Well, a lot has certainly been going on throughout the past week. We'll catch you up on a few things with our Bronx updates. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that New York City health and hospitals are expanding testing centers across the five boroughs to ensure the most impacted communities have access to COVID-19 tests. The selected sites are in East New York, Brooklyn, Morrisania, and the Bronx, Harlem in Manhattan, and Jamaica and Queens, and Clifton in Staten Island. Now, according to the mayor, the opening of the five sites will be contingent on getting enough testing kits from the federal government or private companies. Now the mayor is calling on the government to provide New York City with the materials to test 110,000 people for the virus, including 25,000 test kits specifically for city hospitals and the new testing sites. The mayor also announced the New York City health hospital system will be hiring 500 temporary workers to start work immediately on non-clinical tasks like transporting patients, cleaning, and maintenance during the pandemic. The temporary jobs will begin as 90-day assignments begin. I should say the temporary jobs will begin as 90-day assignments are intended for New Yorkers who've also lost their jobs during the outbreak of the coronavirus. Since the COVID-19 pandemic started, the New York State Department of Labor has seen a spike in unemployment insurance claims and even launched a new unemployment application to deal with the increase in demand. In other news, city hospitals are on the verge of running out of swabs desperately needed for coronavirus tests. 
The news comes through City Health Department Deputy Commissioner Dimitri Dallasaskis, who raised the issue in an alert to city health care workers. Dr. Dallasaskis stated, quote, there's a serious shortage of the swabs used for collecting upper respiratory specimens required for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Now, as the swab supply continues to decline, there's a real possibility that hospitals will completely run out, end quote. Well, hospital leaders acknowledge a shortage. Northwell Health is experiencing a backlog of 4,000 suspected COVID-19 patients currently awaiting testing and is processing 2,000 tests a day. Well, the coronavirus has impacted how many families mourn, we also have families as well as funeral directors who've been extremely overwhelmed. Our Bronx reporter Sanji Lopez brings us the story. COVID-19 has impacted so much of our daily lives, including the way we mourn. When it comes to arranging funeral services for loved ones who've passed on, families have been forced to adapt to a new normal. The ability to be able to um, have some sort of service, whether that's an immediate burial at the cemetery or if a family chooses to do cremation. Um, there is almost a seven to eight day waiting period prior to a cremation taking place because there is such a backlog for that. Jimmy Olson, a spokesperson for the National Funeral Directors Association, tells us about some of the challenges and new guidelines that funerals have implemented in order to ensure families are able to say goodbye safely, like limiting services to 10 people or less and offering virtual services. So it's been very difficult for families to be able to have funerals. Things have gotten smaller. With our cemeteries, if we do do an outdoor service, such as a graveside service, we obviously have to still practice um, safe distancing. And some of the cemeteries have put in requirements saying, again, 10 or less, maybe 20 or less, 30 or less. But that's depending on the state, the city, and even the, um, the cemetery itself. So that limits the amount of people. So what does that leave for families? Um, some families have chosen, if funeral homes offer it, and most do, is video conferencing or, or playing the services online so that people can attend the service virtually. On March 19th, the Department of Homeland Security issued a statement naming mortuary workers as critical infrastructure workers. In an open letter to Governor Andrew Cuomo, the NFDA now requests licensed reciprocity for funeral directors, which would allow directors from other states to travel and assist overwhelmed partners in states like New York, the epicenter of COVID-19. For those funeral homes on the front line there, just to have the extra people to um, support their staff, let someone else take a break, um, give someone one night off, let them sleep in, just to be able to assist making um, what we call transfers, going to bring someone's loved one back into our care. It could be so helpful to these funeral directors who are working 24 hours a day. To stay up to date on the latest changes, rules, and regulations in regards to funerals during the COVID-19 pandemic, visit nfda.org. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. And thank you, Sanji. And BronxNet will continue to give you more coverage surrounding the coronavirus pandemic. We'll have more news coming up right after this. With coronavirus spreading, people at higher risk must take extra precautions. You're at higher risk if you're over 65 or if you have an underlying medical condition. Please visit coronavirus.gov for more information. And welcome back to Open. Darren Jaime here with you as we continue to bring you news, information, and the content and the things that you need to know pertaining the Bronx and New York City. Well, as COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc across New York City, many people are working on the front lines. Our next guest is one that's actually doing both. She's working front lines in government and then also working front lines as a nurse. We're pleased to have joining us now assembly member from the 87th Assembly District right here in the borough of the Bronx, Karina Reyes, and thank you, Assemblywoman Reyes, for joining us here on Open. My pleasure. Hi, Darren. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. And first of all, thank you for your service and what you continue to do on the front lines for uh, New Yorkers as a nurse and being frontline. And if you could just give us a little bit of a of, of a walkthrough of what are you seeing uh, behind those hospital doors that maybe we're not seeing. Well, it's interesting because when I when people ask me if uh, if I'm working with COVID patients, I have to tell them that almost every patient in the hospital is COVID. Um, every floor on every unit has been turned uh, into COVID beds. Um, 
we have patients in common areas or what used to be family areas that were never uh, meant for patient care. But now uh, when the governor asked us to increase capacity by 50 percent, so now there's hospital beds in waiting rooms and family rooms in spaces where we normally would not put patients in. Um, so many patients are either on oxygen or ventilated. Uh, and I was commenting to you that uh, the hospital where I work in, in Montefiore in the Bronx here, we had run out of ventilators by um, March 27th already. Every ventilator that we've used since then has been some kind of portable machine that has been brought in uh, or procured from either the hospital or the governor. Um, and, and we had never seen numbers like this, the amount of people sick and how severe and acutely ill people are becoming. And when you look at what you're seeing right now. Uh, as one who works in the healthcare field, you said you've never seen this before. Um, talk to us about the, the, the attitude and, and, and really the morale of those who are working behind the scenes. I mean, you guys have record numbers that you're dealing with. And then, as you said, many of these people have been vented. So give us a little bit about morale and, and, and the mindset in there. Yeah, well, morale is definitely low. Um, I think a lot of us uh, hold on to each other's faith and, and hold on to each other for support. But the reality is that as healthcare workers, we're not immune to being sick. So many of the nurses and the doctors, the PAs, the ancillary staff, I mean, people who work in the kitchens, the secretary, everybody's getting sick. So uh, we're all uh, overworked, understaffed. Um, on a regular day, they wouldn't give you two patients on a ventilator, but the reality is that when you have very little staff, you might end up with three patients on a ventilator and you have a census um, or a, a patient load of maybe eight, nine. Some nurses have said we've had 12 patients on the shift because there's only two nurses on the floor, whereas on a regular day under normal circumstances, you would have five or six nurses on the floor. Um, we are worn out and exhausted. It's one of the reasons why I went back to work because I know they need me. I know that they're short staffed. Um, and if there's anything that I could do to help um, by putting my expertise to use, uh, that's the only thing that I can do. But uh, we're all very tired. Mm -hmm. And let me shift gears a little bit. And it's probably staying along the same lines because in addition to working in the nursing field, of course, you're representing the borough of the Bronx as an assemblywoman. Uh, and recently the budget was passed. And I know that a lot of concern was given and a lot of voices raised for Medicare cuts. Given the fact of what you're seeing right now uh, with what's happening in the hospital, talk to us about your thoughts on the Medicare cuts, uh, given the fact that you guys really are, are already in dire straits. Yeah, and um, the Medicaid cuts will mean um, very austere cuts and measures for not just uh, the patients who receive Medicaid, but for the hospitals and the providers, the Medicaid providers. I was actually one of the members that voted down the budget um, because I believe that there we had we had opportunities to tighten the belt in some areas, uh, fiscal areas in our state, and to really had we had the opportunity to start to raise revenue to make up for the Medicaid shortfall, and we didn't do that. Um, I believe that we had the opportunity this year to raise taxes on the wealthiest people in our state. Um, that's the one or the two percent, the millionaires, the billionaires. Uh, we could have raised taxes on them to kind of um, blunt some of the blow from these Medicaid cuts that were going to come anyway, because we started the year before the coronavirus pandemic with a $6 billion shortfall. And now that's estimated upwards of $15 billion. Um, so I, I believe that we are uh, going to have some difficult times ahead particularly because the Medicaid cuts are scheduled to kick in later, uh, sometime after they say that the state is no longer in a, in a state of emergency. Uh, but I believe, and this is my clinical opinion, that there are gonna be people who are gonna have um, long-term long needs based on, on what we're seeing with how COVID-19 affects people. Um, some folks are gonna either need, if they get to, get to be extubated, are gonna need physical therapy, long-term physical therapy. You have to anticipate that there's gonna be either organ damage or hypoxic brain injuries from uh, the lack of oxygen that people are experiencing. And these are all things that are gonna put a, a burden on Medicaid, particularly because a lot of people are gonna be unemployed after this is uh, said and done. And they're gonna rely on Medicaid. Yeah. And when we look at the numbers, we have like the Bronx has the highest per case fatality rate, uh, you know, in New York City. Um, so when you look at these and going forward, obviously, uh, a financial deficit, 
that the state has already had. And now you're now you're looking at, you know, where we are right now. How do you see things playing out going forward? I mean, the budget is passed already. We know that it's going forward. What can be done to kind of like mitigate and stem off some of these things now that we know that it's going to happen, right? What what can we be doing now? Well, now there's, the, there, there's a, the ability in the budget language for the governor to revisit uh, the budget based on revenue. Um, and that's something that he was given the authority to do because of what's happening. Um, so uh, he has the ability to revisit every quarter based on how much revenue the, the state collects, which could be higher than projected or lower than projected. So we really don't know. The, the, we can anticipate that the cuts could either be not as severe or maybe much deeper than we, than we are projecting right now. Um, and look, and I also want to say that the reason why uh, our mortality rates are so high in the Bronx is because we have some of the highest rates of comorbidities. Uh, it's why we've always talked about Bronx being 62 out of 62. We have some of the highest rates of asthma in all the state. We have the highest rates of um, diabetes, hypertension. Uh, and those are all factors that predispose people to have some of the worst outcomes when they get um, uh, infected with COVID. And I think we need to work uh, really on how we address access to healthcare, access to healthcare for everyone, whether you're documented, undocumented, employed, unemployed, uh, white, black, brown, it doesn't matter. I think that we really need to look at comprehensively how we expand healthcare access for every person in our state, every child, every adult, um, and then everybody in between. Uh, and how we do that as a human right, um, because I believe that healthcare should be a human right. No person should go without access to healthcare. And if we can start to prevent some of these comorbidities early on when the next pandemic, pandemic comes, and I anticipate that this won't be the last, uh, we will be better prepared. Yeah, a lot to think about. Let me go here before we get out of here. Talk to us about your district, right? A lot of services are needed. Uh, what is available in terms of seniors and youth? I know those are the most vulnerable population too as well. Uh, what are things that would, do you wanna share with your district members and the Bronx about services that are available amidst COVID? Yeah, so um, in statute and legislatively, we've expanded, of course, um, unemployment benefits. Uh, in, the last, in the last couple of weeks when we passed the budget, we uh, in, added another 300 workers to the unemployment system just to handle the burden of the amount of calls that they're getting from people in unemployment. Um, in the district, we've had some senior centers that were providing grab-and-go meals for, from, for some of our seniors. Unfortunately, some of our senior housing doesn't have uh, senior centers in them. So we've been working with uh, Chefs for America, uh, partnered with Assemblyman Ma Michael Blake to provide meals for them every day of the week um, to some of these senior buildings. Um, and of course, uh, our public schools are providing grab and go meals for, for kids and students that need it. Um, and our offices are still open, uh, physically not open, but definitely remotely. If people need help with anything, they can call the um, my office number and my staff is ready to help them as best as we can. All righty. Well, we're going to leave it there. Assemblywoman Karina Reyes, thank you so much for joining us here on Open. We continue to give the Bronx as much information as we can. And once again, thank you for the work that you do on the front lines. Uh, most of all, as a nurse and then, of course, and your work in the uh, in government as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren. Stay safe. All righty. Listen, stay with us. We do have more open coming up. We'll be right back right after this. It looks bleak. It feels bleak. But the city isn't shut down because our public services keep working in spite of and in the face of the dangers. We can count on them. And to keep them working and funded, now and in the future, we need to be counted. Self-respond now to the 2020 Census at my2020census.gov. And we're back here on Open. Darren Jaime here with you, and we continue our coverage talking about the borough of the Bronx, New York City, and how we continue to adapt given the fact of COVID-19 and all the effects and the, the ramifications, really. Uh, and our next guest is one that is very familiar, boots on the ground, uh, and knows firsthand about the effects of COVID-19. Uh, his family's been affected. He's been personally uh, affected as well. And he continues to serve in government. None other than Council Member Fernando Cabrera of the 14th Council Matic District. And uh, first of all, Council Member Cabrera, good to see you. And, uh, and first of all, give us an update on your family. 
Well, thank you so much, Darren. Thank you for having your show. Uh, my son, you know, ironically, he recuperated and uh, went to his quarantine. And now he's working in one of the testing uh, stations. Uh, so he's giving back. Uh, wow. My daughter, uh, my son-in-law and the children, you know, my daughter, it hit her hard. She had 105 fever. Uh, it was tough, but she made it uh, through it. A lot of our church member, we did lose one church member uh, just a couple of days ago. It was heartbreaking, uh, but we're standing firm. We, we're being supportive. Uh, we're working together uh, during this time. Yeah. Well, a lot has been going on during this time, you know, since then. And you've had your hands full on both sides, right? Taking care of family, but then also taking care of your constituents. Let me talk a little bit about the constituency right now, because uh, a lot of America, many people will be uh, having the opportunity to take take part in that Paycheck Protection Act. Uh, give us your thoughts on the Paycheck Protection Act and uh, why you think that's important for uh, Bronxites to tap into. You know, it's a very in, uh, important uh, step that uh, the Congress took. It's the most important step that they have taken uh, to get our economy uh, uh, back online uh, and to helping the average uh, business person and churches. Churches are included as well. And so basically the payroll payback uh, would allow you to uh, get ten, uh, eight weeks worth of salary uh, you can use 25% of that towards your rent or mortgage, whatever the total of the salary is. Uh, and they could apply through their local bank, a preferred lender, like Chase, like Bank of America, uh, Ponce de Leon. They could reach out to the local banker. Uh, and my suggestion is to do it quickly. Uh, there's only so much money. Now, this week, Congress is going to come back and put another $250 billion because the, the first installment, they're basically running out of that money. Uh, so they have to come back and redo it. You could do up to $10 million if that, that's, that's what your salary base was at uh, with if you have 500 or less employees. This is going to help. I'm telling you, I'm getting phone calls from business uh, men and women who are very concerned uh, that they're gonna that they want to bounce back, uh, but it takes capital to do that. And I think that Congress, after this, may have to do us another extension of it because I, the prolonged time that we have right now uh, is is really putting uh, some businesses deeper and deeper in the hole, especially when it comes to rent. I think that's going to be the fundamental root problem at the end of the day. Yeah. Talk to us about rent, because you have a lot of population that's out there right now in the borough uh, who, who are renters. Some of them are having a hard time being able to pay their rent and understanding that, yes, there, there can be no evictions during this time. And I understand that's what the law says, no evictions during this time. But there still is a, a heavy concern that after this is all over, if I still don't have a job, where am I going to live? So have we even looked at that? And where, 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 what kind of advice do you have or what kind of legislation can we see coming that may be able to give some support to people? So there is a moratorium until uh, June 20th. Uh, so no one uh, can be evicted. If you find yourself in that situation, call 311. It's that simple. Call 311 and one of, the city would assign a lawyer to you to make sure that you don't get evicted. The reality is right now in the Bronx, we only have one judge working on site and that's for emergency cases where there's abuse taking place. But let me be clear and people need to know that this is a moratorium, it's not a forgiveness program. So people still have to pay the rent. I, please do not eat your seeds. Uh, you're gonna have to pay your rent. Now, I think Darren, that the state of New York should follow uh, the plan that we find in Delaware. In Delaware, every renter is getting $1,500. Mm -hmm. I don't see no reason why here in New York, when the government is the one who told us basically to shut it down, and rightly so, that they should not come through with some kind of a rental assistance 
because then it has a ripple effect with the landlords. The landlords got, you know, the mom and pops, they got two or three bedroom apartment. They, they have their mortgage. It's it just, we will have a financial collapse taking place here if we don't have some kind of a level of assistance to those who need it. There are people who work it. There are people who make more money than ever right now. Uh, they should be excluded. But those who are genuinely in need should get that government help. Yeah, and and we're praying because a lot of people are out there and, you know, tenants' rights is big. Uh, and they've had some pre-existing problems before. And coming out of this, you know, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be in, 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 a lot, in a lot of concern. I want to go back for a minute and talk a little bit about, you know, COVID because as you, you continue to provide resources in your councilmatic district for people who've been affected, um, we understand that the numbers disproportionately are affecting communities of color. Uh, your thoughts and what would you like to see done? Thank you so much, Darren, because that is, is, I've been sounding that trumpet for a long time because, you know, I saw what was happening at the beginning and because my son was one of the first ones here in the Bronx and we had a cluster uh, that developed in our church. So I've been very much, I saw what was happening. I was, I, I was seeing the pattern. Uh, here's the reality, I, I think, in the Bronx and, and in our communities of, of color is that we are the front line. We have the type of jobs that are essential workers. And I mentioned this in the news, uh, throughout the news, uh, paper and otherwise that our people are the bus driver, our people are the nurses, our people, our people are the ones who have to go to work. They don't have a choice. And, and this is why I, I have called for, for all of our essential workers to get PPEs because they're the most likely to receive it and to transmit it. So imagine you go to a supermarket, that person there is, is coming in contact with every family Think about it. Every all the supermarket. Eventually, you have to get food, so right. we should give them protective gear. And so, I think that uh, yesterday I had a meeting with uh, professionals frontline. We spent two hours. We have a plan that we're gonna uh, present to the governor and to the mayor uh, to work in this. Today, the mayor announced another ten million dollars uh, involved in the media. So we could get through non-traditional ways to reach in our communities where they're not getting and disseminating the information correctly. So there is, uh, there are efforts, but we need to do more, a lot more. Yeah, uh, and a lot more needs to, uh, you know, a lot more certainly needs to be done when we talk about this. Uh, when we talk about this particular issue. Before we go, real quickly, uh, give an opportunity for those who may be in your district. Talk about resources. Some people may be struggling with food or uh, some of the basic necessities. What's available? How do they tap in? Let me just say, uh, they could call us at our office. Now, every councilmatic, senator, uh, office, assemblyman office is closed right now, but we are working. I tell you, we put in long hours because the need is so great. They could call us at office, our, our office at 347 five nine zero twenty eight seventy four let me say that again three four seven five nine zero twenty eight seventy four but let me also say there that the easiest way to get information whether it's food uh whether it's testing site all of it is three three one one the city has done a good job to try to centralize the information that way we're not floating around with a lot of different kind of phone numbers and only a select few could get a hold of it. So call 311, whatever you need is, or you could contact the, your local council member. You could check us, us out at our council website and we have all of the emails of all of our staff listed. So those who are already working with us could continue to do so. And those who need help, please contact us. We want to be of help. We have seen tremendous help. There are even something as, how do I go about doing a funeral? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have received phone calls of, of, of families uh, that don't understand the process, the food process. Right now, the Kingsbridge Armory, they're distributing food uh, to those who don't have meals on wheels 
every other day that will call in and food will be distributed uh, to them. There is a lot of help, mental health, NYC Well. They could call 1-800-NYC Well and they could get mental health uh, assistance. So the help is there. Tap into it. Don't be shy. This is the time that I would tell our people, reach out to it. You're not alone. Well, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera of the 14th Councilmatic District in the Borough of the Bronx, thank you. It's good to hear that your family is recovering and good to hear that uh, things are moving forward for you guys as well. All the prayers and blessings to you. Thank you for sharing with us here on Open. Thank you so much. All righty, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. And listen, we want you to stay tuned. We do have more Open coming up right after this. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Glad to have you sharing with us as we continue to bring you coverage across New York City, the Bronx, talking about a variety of different things. But of course, front and center, the issue of COVID-19 and how it's affecting uh, Bronxites, Bronx institutions. And so we have a very special guest in the studio sharing with us a little bit about, well, I should say in studio, coming from home, I should say, or <laughs> in a remote location better. How about that? Lorraine Cashin, who's actually the director of a physician assistant studies at Mercy College. And no, she's not in the studio. She's not going to tell you where she is, but we do know that she's virtual. Lorraine, how are yes. you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. You know, we're so used to like doing the show in studio and having it. So, you know, there's just certain things just flow like naturally, right? But the truth yeah. is we're coming virtually because um, COVID has caused a lot of adjustments. And so if you could share with us a little bit about, you know, your physician's assistant uh, studies program and how that's been affected uh, through this all? Well, our program has really been um, very severely affected. We've gone from pulling our students out. We have two cohorts going at a time. We've pulled our students out of the clinical, out of their clinical year, which should have been their final year. They're one rotation away from graduation and they can't finish that rotation until this clears up. So that's been a pretty, um, a pretty serious um, sequence of events for them. Um, and it was, you know, it was really a serious thought process that a, a lot of, a lot of opinions and, and weight went into that through administration, through us. Um, the second year students are finishing up their didactic year. We had to tr transition into a fully online. So mm -hmm. there is no, nobody on the campus. If you go onto the campus, it's like a ghost town. It's kind of a little creepy, um, but it is um, fully online. So all the students are, are, have transitioned online. So we're doing all of our classes online. We're testing online. I'm holding my director meetings online. We're having advising online, office hours online. So it's, it's completely different. It's as if they've now um, gone to an online school. Right. Uh, and I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll come back to uh, a little bit about the learning process, because obviously that that's an adjustment from being in a classroom to going online. I'll, I'll let you jump into that in a second. But I want to also ask you about your graduates, right? Because these mm -hmm. graduates are now are now hitting the front lines. And uh, yes. who would ever thought that, like, as soon as you graduate, that you'd have to immediately go into what is the epicenter of this pandemic? Yes. Yes, and we have a lot of them. As a matter of fact, I'm collecting a lot of them to create a, um, a tribute wall. And we have so many that have written back to me and I see them in their PPE, which is their personal protective equipment. And I am just tremendously proud of all of them. But they are, if they weren't in the front line, if they weren't in the emergency room or in the ICU or on the internal medicine floor, they've been repurposed and now they're there. So they're not mm -hmm. only learning for the first time what it's like to be in the emergency room, but they are learning by baptism by fire. So Lorraine, if you could share a little bit with me about the work that Mercy is doing, particularly with Elmhurst Hospital. 
and we know Elmer's Hospital is ground zero. And I know you guys are doing a great job of also preparing supplies and sending supplies. So share a little bit about how that supply chain is being is, is being doled out. Well, Darren, we have a lot of programs, health science, natural science programs, health science programs um, within our college. So we have a lot of the supplies that the students would normally wear as they train to get ready to go out. So what we did was um, myself, Brian Baker and Lori Bubb went up to the campus, onto the Bronx campus, and we gathered everything that we could that we knew that they needed. And we packed our cars full and we drove them down to the Bronx and we met Dr. Cherkis, who is the medical director of the PA program on, in the Bronx, the Firm Mercy College, um, and also works at Elmhurst. So we met him there and we gave him the medical supplies. Yeah, yeah. A, 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 lot, a lot of need, particularly at Elmhurst Hospital. We know that they've been going through it and we continue to follow it, uh, you know, from head to toe. But talk to us about some of your physician assistants and where they're actually working and what things they're actually doing. Because when we hear physician's assistants, you know, that's a general term, but there's some real, you know, let, let's put some legs to that. Our physician assistants, we have some at Elmhurst. Our physician assistants are the first ones in the patient's room in some of the COVID patient's rooms that are seeing them, diagnosing them, treating them, you know, it, putting them on ventilators, sometimes extubating them, sometimes pronouncing the time that they die. You know, it's, they are really, along with the physicians, they are the front line with the nurses, with the doctors, but they are, um, they're really out there. They're the heroes as well as the doctors and all healthcare, everybody in healthcare and, and armed forces and police and everybody else. I'm gonna give credit to everybody, but our PAs are really out there and they're strong and they're in Montfury, they're in the Bronx. I mean, our communities are really very similar. So yeah. to the populations that we serve. So we want to we want to give everybody the opportunity to have as much equipment as possible to you know be the strongest that they can to survive through all this yeah. and come out stronger. You know, as a director, right? I know that you're involved in the training component and, and getting them ready for this. Uh, but when you say getting them ready getting them ready, but when you talk about this, um, yeah. did you ever think that we would be seeing this? I know that you've got to train people, but uh, to be trained for this is something that a lot of people are saying, listen, we, we never expected to happen. No, no, I mean, we never, I trained at Elmhurst, right? So it's mm. a level one trauma hospital and I trained for a lot and, and working with the students, you train them to expect the worst and hope for the best. But never, ever did you really think on this scale would we be seeing something like this. Right. So right. that's why I say I'm extremely proud of my students because they're holding up tremendously. There may be some people who are inspired, right, who want to get on the front lines sure. now. They listen, sure. I want to do this, and I'm, 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 I'm liking what I see in terms of public service. So talk to people about if they have this desire and they want to learn and they want to get in this program, what do they do? What do they do? They start with taking some science classes and they start to really understand, is it that, that they wanna be a hero because everybody loves a hero or do they wanna be a physician assistant, right? And then that's working in healthcare. And that's sometimes hopefully when COVID is gone, it's doing the everyday things, but it's still a great profession. And even today people can help, people can give blood, people can donate their plasma, people, people behind the lines that are dropping off food, people that are picking up garbage. You know, there's, there's heroes everywhere you look. People like BronxNet that make the communities aware of what's happening and give them resources to turn to. You guys are heroes yourselves. Oh, well, thank you. You guys are too. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with us. Lorraine Cashman, thank you so much. Great work. Director of the Physician's Assistant Studies Program at Mercy College. Keep up the great work and stay safe. Thank you, Darren. You too. All righty. Listen, we want you to continue to stay connected to us. We do have more open coming up. We'll be right back right after this.
back to Open. Darren Jaime here with you, and we are glad to have you sharing with us as we continue to bring you news, information, content, and the things that you need to know, particularly as the Bronx and New York City uh, reacts and tries to deal with all this happening with COVID-19. Seniors are a very important population during this time, one of the most vulnerable populations during this time. And here to talk a little bit about what is going on with regards to seniors, we're pleased to be joined by Julie Dalton, and she's the Executive Director of the Riverdale Senior Services. And uh, Julie, good to have you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here. And I love what you say about, you know, highlighting our older neighbors, a very important segment of our population. Well, it is is it important, right? But not only is it important, but they are the most vulnerable during this time. And a lot of questions, you know, we know this, uh, that seniors, you know, we want to keep them safe. We want to do the best mm -hmm. that they can, we can to keep them safe. And I know one of those things we want to talk about is like meals, because that it, contrary to popular belief, something as basic as a meal is a big issue for seniors. It definitely is an issue. And I will say before we get into that, I think what we found, because we were um, and are a very robust senior center. So in the matter of a few weeks, we had to move from welcoming people to our place to trying to do everything digitally and remotely. So that's been a challenge for us, but we're meeting that challenge. But through it all, I will say that older adults are very resilient. But yes, you've touched on a very good issue. The basics of food and food access is a critical issue. We uh, work with the Department for the Aging. I think in a very short time, they had to move from our model of having people come to a congregate site to get meals to a delivery system. So again, I give them kudos for working on that so quickly. However, there certainly are challenges with rolling out that system. So we're doing our best. Our social workers have stepped up to the plate. Last week alone, we spoke to over 500 people to assess mm. their need of food access. So again, I think what we try to do now is we refer people to the Department for the Aging because we no longer provide that meal directly. We've also now updated our website, rssny.org, with lots of resources for other opportunities or resources where people can get food. And I think also, too, we really want to make sure that the community knows that if you live in an apartment building and there's older neighbors, if it's safe for you to do so, check in with them. Maybe you could go, if someone from your household goes shopping once a week, maybe you could pick up something for that neighbor. Yeah, those are very those are very important, uh, you know, items that we need to think about, particularly with the senior population. I know for a fact that you said earlier about being involved, right? And staying yeah. connected, is staying connected with, with with your population. It's become increasingly hard because of social distancing, because of what's going on. How have you navigated that? Because I, I think you you let you let a little bit about that earlier, but I know it's been a challenge for you. It is. And social isolation, what we call social isolation, even in normal times, can be an issue for an older person in the community who may live alone, who may have family further by. So now what we've had to do is move everything from in person to connecting. One of our challenges is about 40 percent of our members that come regularly to RSS are connected on social media or the Internet. But there's another group of people that aren't. So what we're doing now is, again, as I mentioned, our social workers, we're doing check-in phone calls with people. We also want to remember that people are going to go through a lot of uh, emotions. We have a geriatric mental health program that we're now doing via telephone and via video conference. So that's one thing we're doing. We're also having some of our wonderful instructors, our Tai Chi instructor, our art instructor, do virtual classes for our members. And again, the other people we don't want to leave out of this equation are the caregivers, whether they are caring for an elderly parent, possibly somebody with dementia or cognitive issues. We also now do uh, caregiver support groups online. And we have a list of those programs again on our website. I want to, if you can real quickly, share a little bit about the whole issue of this isolation, right? Because as seniors, traditionally one of the big battles that, is, that are fought is isolation. And so you have the issue of isolation. Um, and then in addition to isolation, you know, the mental health component, that's big too. Absolutely. Because again, so many people would come to RSS in the normal times, as I call it, because they see their friends 
It's a reason for them to get up and go out. We provide transportation services. So now, you know, when we do our check-in phone calls with them, they'll say, well, how's Sarah doing? How's Margie doing? I miss seeing all my friends. So we, you know, continue to connect them. And again, our social workers are very astute in asking those questions so that if we can identify that someone is um, feeling depressed or anxious, frankly, who isn't anxious during this pandemic, you know, we can then connect them to other resources through our organization or themselves. But I think it's knowing that they're not alone. So um, we, I got an email just this morning from the mother of one of our participants in our Center for uh, Memory Loss, mm -hmm. thanking us and thanking our director for engaging her mother so well and being so kind and caring. That means everything to us because we think of RSS as a family and these are our family members. So we know that when this is over, we'll be stronger, but we're there every step of the way for people that are feeling isolated. Yeah, and before we go, please do me a favor and share with people, how do they stay connected to you in a time such as this? And if they're having some challenges, how do they get in touch with you so that way you might be able to better serve them? The first way, they can call us, 718-884-5900. Please be patient. Obviously, we're not there, but we do check the voicemail. There's very specific instructions. They can leave their name and phone number. Uh, if they don't have email and let us know briefly what the issue is. And then one of our staff will contact them. They can also just go to our website, rssny.org. They can fill out a contact me form. They can sign up for some of our wonderful programs that are coming up. Or again, they can just leave their name or email and then we will reach out to them. Thank you so much, Julie, for all the great work that you're doing. I know it's a little bit challenging. I think all of us are challenged in making adjustments. You know, but we're able to do things virtually. And, um, you know, thank you yes. for being a part of, uh, you know, of our virtual family that we could be able to share all that's going on at RSS as well. Julie, thanks a lot. Thank you and stay safe and be healthy. Hey, the same to you. All righty. Julie Dalton of Riverdale Senior Services. Listen, take a quick break. We will be back. We've got more show coming up right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And we are back here on Open. Darren Jaime here with you. And listen, we're trying to give you as much information and content to help you navigate through COVID-19 uh, as New York City and particularly the borough of the Bronx continues to be adversely affected in all of this uh, and for all of us it's some adjustments as you know we're making adjustments virtually uh we're not in studio but we're making adjustments virtually a lot of people transition from office to home and uh and you got some homeschooling that's going on if you've got children so a lot of different adjustments so uh our next guest no stranger uh my sister and friend gonna help us to navigate through some of these challenges talk about elizabeth Carraza, and she's a career strategist TV contributor. She's worked at Reuters. She's worked with us here at Bronxnet, and she's going to work us through and help us through. So, Elizabeth, good to have you back. Thank you for having me. I love speaking with you, Darren. Oh, I love it, too. Listen, so let's get right at it. I mean, we're all working from home, right? I mean, this is our, this is our ideal thing. We're working from home, but for many people, it's Zoom meetings and it's, you know, navigating emails. So so give us a little bit about trying to be productive at home during this time because a lot of people are failing miserably. Yes, yes. Many of us feel like that. And I want everyone to remember that it is normal to feel this way, that it's this new norm. How can I make the best of this new norm when I have everything kind of feeling like I've been thrown at me, like work and maybe homeschooling and, and caring for elderly parents, whatever it might be, you got this, okay? 
and the way you're feeling is normal. We are all feeling like this. You are not alone. So you want to make sure you do have that designated workspace. Look, if you have a, an office where you can shut the door, that's great. But I do recognize that a lot of us live in apartment buildings. So you know what? There's not a lot of rooms in your apartment. So if you don't have that, that office space to yourself, perhaps you can use the bedroom somewhere where you can close the door so you can set boundaries and have boundaries with your with your family members the other thing i want to say is schedule is king calendar is king or queen okay so if you can get most things in that calendar you're going to feel more organized more on top of things more in control creating that routine and having it in the calendar yeah but talk to me because when you talk about having a calendar, having that routine, we have a regular routine at work. We know what we're going to do. This I'm doing this, I'm doing this. But at home, there are a whole lot of things that can creep in. The kids can creep in. Um, you know, that phone call that we shouldn't take probably comes in. Um, then I got to navigate the emails and social media. So give me a little bit about how I should prioritize getting this done because priority is always going to be key in productivity. Exactly, Darren. And I want you to revisit your goals. And if you don't have goals, that's okay. I want you to create them. Because now that you're working from home, everything has changed. So you want to figure out, like you just mentioned, what is my, what are my top five priorities? Where and what are my priorities and where am I on that list? You, you should be your number one priority. Because if you don't feel organized, in control, energized, you're not going to be able to be that model employee that you'd like to be or that best parent or that best homeschooler that you need to be now. So chunking off times in your calendar, look, they could be half hour times, like when you're not in a Zoom meeting, maybe the Zoom meeting's an hour, you put that in. But for, for other things you need to, to, to do, what I like to do is I set my alarm on my phone for 22 minutes. I want to do this, finish off this presentation. I want to finish off these emails. I've got this project to do. If I can't do it for 22 minutes, please somebody help me. So I, I do 22 minutes at a time. And then if I feel like I can continue without checking social media, getting right. up to get a drink of water, then when I get up to drink, get a drink of water, I'm distracted by everything. So you want to, you know, have those alarms on your phone to, to really keep you organized. It helps me and my clients. Yeah. The unknown. A lot of us are dealing with the fear of the unknown. We don't know when we're going back to work. Don't know when we're going back to school. The unknown is is a big cloud that hangs over people's heads. How do you coach somebody through navigating through the fear of the unknown? Well, the unknown is really real right now, but you want to remain in charge and in control. So you want to make a list and think about strategize, have these moments to yourself, close the door and think about what am I in charge of right now? What am I in control of? You make that list, you put it on paper, on your phone, on your computer, somewhere where you can see it and you revisit that because by creating that list, by having it on paper where someone, where you can see it, it really does help us to feel like, okay, there might not be everything I can control, but I can control these factors. I'm still in control of many aspects of my life. Yeah. And being overwhelmed is a big thing, you know? Uh, and when you're overwhelmed, sometimes we go to our, you know, our go-tos. Give me a, a few seconds about social media as the go-to. Uh, I've said to people that I really don't like going to social media these days um, with the amount of deaths that I'm seeing. My timeline is looking more like an obituary. So I really, you know, have tried to like limit that. But uh, your thoughts on on social media? Yeah, I think it just depends on the position you're in right now. Sometimes people like to take a break during their day, go on social media. There's some, you know, little funny jokes people say, you know, about toilet paper or like, you know, beans. Let, let's, you know, let's everybody slow down. There's enough for everybody. And sometimes that can lift spirits. But at the same time, I do understand and I do get what you're saying. It's the news, the new news feeds, the obituaries that really can get us down. So put a time limit on your social media for the day. Maybe it's half hour. Maybe it's 15 minutes. Maybe you take a complete break. It's whatever you feel will serve you. And if you're starting to feel anxious or anxiety by going on social media, listen to yourself, listen to your body. Yeah. And uh, when you talk about social media, one of the things you can do for a break is what? Get some fresh air. The governor's talked about us being able to go outside, having some air, 
uh, taking advantage of the outside, not not really so, but social distancing. We want to say that, but but really, you know, using that as a part of the way of the you know of the healing and getting through this. Getting through this, keeping your sanity. I go for a walk every single day, even if it's just around the block. I've got my mask on. I got my gloves on. I do the whole thing. And it just helps to clear your mind. It helps to improve focus. Studies show it can help to improve your digestive system. You know, it it, 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 it releases endorphins and, and can help you be happier. So please, if you can, if you're able to get outside for that walk, get outside for that fresh air. However, I know not all of us can do that in this moment. So let's think about what else can I do to clear my mind, to clear the anxiety? Many things you can do. Number one, make phone calls to your pastor, a mentor, friend, a coach, what else can I do? Okay, well, what about meditation? You might be new to meditation, but there's all kinds of free services online. There's Headspace. There is Deepak Chopra. You just Google it. And look, if you're not completely tech savvy and that's not something that you really want to be doing or you're able to, you know, just deep breathing in for four, out for four, count it in your mind and try to just focus on that breath. Yeah. Got to breathe, got to take it easy. Um, and I know one of the things we talk about, I use this I use this terminology all the time, but before we go, share with us a little bit about this terminology, about putting gas in your tank. Yes, okay. If you are running on empty, if your nerves are shot, people are getting on your nerves at home, that is normal. <laughs> How you're feeling is normal. Yeah. Uh, you're feeling stressed and strained with the demand from homeschooling or your boss or, or fears of layoff or cutbacks or anything along those lines. You want to be doing what makes you feel good. So we talked about getting fresh air. We talked about going for a walk or a run or whatever you're able to do in your community. But what else can you do in home? Meditation. And what about some exercise from home? Even if it's in your bedroom, clearing a space, you've got to do what's going to fill up that gas tank. And that could be taking a nap or exercise. So I love this one YouTube uh, yoga professional. Her name is Yoga with Adrian. It, I am a new woman after I do that. And I am not a yoga expert. They have super beginner classes and they'll have more advanced classes. If you're new to it, stick to beginner and just, just try it. Start trying new and different right, things. Right, like meditation right. is newer for me. I've always had a hard time sticking to it, but I am this time because it helps me fill the gas tank. Because if your gas tank is empty, you can't give to anybody else. And that's when we get cranky and snappy and edgy and no one wants to feel like that. I don't, and I know my family doesn't either. Yeah. In my other line of work, I tell people, you can't give out of an empty cup. That's exactly how it is. That's the truth. Exactly. Exactly, Darren. Elizabeth, love having you. And we got to keep we got to keep in contact because certainly we're going to need you through this. I mean, a lot of people are trying to find ways and trying to reinvent themselves and do this. And it's very important. And so some practical applications are always good. Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm here for you and Bronxnet and all your viewers. Thanks, Darren. Thank you very much, Elizabeth Carazza, our guest here on Open. And uh, yes, got to tell you, friends, it's about time that we end the show. We are out of time. want to thank our guests for joining us. But most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Bronxnet's Channel 67, Fios, that would be Channel 33, or anytime on the web at Bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, coming virtually, I am Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, make sure you keep this channel wide open as we bring you news, content, and information. Rena Valentino will be back on Friday. She'll be giving you some entertainment and giving you some stuff to uplift your spirit on Friday on Open. Take care, everybody. Talk to you soon.